All right, here we go. Good morning, everybody, every small group of people who made it at 8 a.m. on Friday. Welcome to the last day of Dreamforce. <laughs> um, I assume that because everyone is here at 8 a.m., that means everyone is super interested in this incredibly fascinating topic that we'll be talking about today, B2B commerce, front-end customization, a dozen do's and don'ts. I'm John Esposito. I'm a senior Salesforce developer at Six Tree Technologies, and this. I'm Jonathan Keel, founder and CEO of Six Tree Technologies. So well, we'll talk a little bit about um, Six Street and about our relevant experience in a minute. Um, but first, of course, we have our forward-looking statement. Um, not that we're revealing any new technologies or anything, but um, this we always show. We don't make decisions about things that don't exist. Um, feels a little bit funny having to welcome to Dreamforce slide on a Friday morning. But um, for those of you who are still here, this is hopefully what you've been looking forward to the whole time. So <laughs> on now, um, let's talk a little bit about our company. Yeah, so uh, before we go into all the uh, details, a little bit about ourselves, you know, why are we giving this talk and why should you even listen to us? Um, Six Street Technologies, or just Six Street, we call ourselves now. We're a B2B commerce focused partner. Um, we also do other clouds, sales clouds, service clouds, everything else out there. We were founded actually in 2012, and I was actually part of the company that created the Cloud Trace product, which later became B2B commerce. So we have a lot of experience in these types of implementations. I mean, going back a long, long ways. Um, we were actually the first. Salesforce B2B Car Certified Navigator Partner. Um, we're very proud of that, and if you go up an app exchange, you'll see that we have like a perfect, you know, five-star rating, 10 out of 10 CSAT score. All of our developers are on shore, and the, the, the main thing that sets us apart from everybody else, a lot of other partners will go out there and kind of come in with their, you know, truck of people, unload them, and get the project going. We can do uh, projects uh, uh, kind of turnkey, but one of the things we like to do is work with our customers to kind of enable them to take on the B2B commerce projects themselves later. So sometimes we'll have maybe a developer kind of like a staff hog and work with them. Sometimes it's a, a smaller team, but that way your team can also be enabled as well. So we do um, kind of like several different uh, formats of how we do projects with our customers uh, versus like other partners that just sort of come in, do everything, and then leave. Turnkey, yeah, yeah, exactly. So just real quick, make sure everyone's on the same page. What is B2B commerce? Um, there are two things that it's a little confusing in uh, commerce cloud. So there's a B2C, which is demandware. Demandware um, was acquired by Salesforce, and it does like the, you know, of course, business to consumer. Um, the B2B commerce uh, product is uh, what was probably called CloudTrace, another acquisition. Um, the B2B experiences focuses on things such as, um, you know, contract-based pricing, uh, account-based pricing. So that with the B2C experience, you know, if someone comes up, to your site, they might want to buy something like shoes, you get one price for that, but with the B2B experience, what you're really doing is you're giving each of your different customers different prices. So um, one customer may log in, see a price, and purchase that product, or a list of products, another customer comes in, you see a completely different price, um, and purchase those products for that. So it's very good for industries such as manufacturing, retail, uh, distribution, and also um, uh, high tech and consumer packaged goods. Um, and also, a little bit of history, um, you know, back since, since I was a part of the original team, there was a, 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 a consulting firm called EDL Consulting, doesn't exist anymore, it got bought by Simplus. Um, they built this cloud craze application, which was supposed to be commerce on Salesforce. Later it got acquired by Salesforce, and today is what is known as Salesforce B2B Commerce. Um, John's going to talk a little bit more about the stack, but it you know, started off with sort of visual force, started getting some more like visual force and remoting, and now the technology in the front end, which we're gonna talk about more today, is around like Backbone, JS, and Handlebars. Yeah, which are technologies that not every front end developer is at these days super familiar with. Backbone is considered kind of a slightly old fashioned technology if you look at the state of JavaScript surveys. Um, what's nice about it is it's pretty lightweight. It doesn't, it's not very opinionated, so it doesn't force you into certain paradigms. Um, the thing to remember about uh, B2B commerce, and this was a little bit of, it takes a little bit of getting used to, is that it's a true full stack web application. As a Salesforce developer, um, you may not be uh, totally accustomed to that style of development. Um, really what uh, Cloud Craze, and I'm gonna use the term Cloud Craze here interchangeably with B2B commerce because the namespace we'll be talking about is CCRZ, so it's more obviously gonna be related to Cloud Craze. It's a true full stack web, app web application that takes, uh, takes advantage of the platform, <coughs> excuse me, the force.com platform um, in great part for authentication. And it also takes advantage of the JavaScript remoting um, security capabilities. That's actually just really nice to have for free. But if you're gonna write Cloud Craze stuff, you're mostly gonna be thinking full stack web application. It's not gonna feel like customization of 
Salesforce as you would normally be accustomed to as a visual force or even a lightning developer. I mentioned that the technology is a little bit aging um, on the uh, client side. Um, again, I actually like the fact that Backbone is not super opinionated. On the server side, which we won't talk about today, but it's worth noting because this is a full stack web application, it's architected more like a kind of a Java enterprise application. There's proper like data layers, data access objects, service layers, logic layers, heavy customization allowed by the very, very sophisticated, not 100% like small customization salesforce but more like full-fledged web application capabilities. The logic is mixed between the client and the server side in varying degrees though. We'll be focusing on the client, but when we get to cart and checkout, you'll see there's a lot more business logic on the client side than you might intuitively expect. All right. So let's get to our six do's and don'ts for Salesforce B2B commerce front end customization. Events are your friend, extend, don't replace, design with the out of the box single page application in mind, component dies, use the CCRZ backbone framework, and support declarative customization. Some of these are just technical kinds of issues, some of these are design related issues that have to do with expectations of Salesforce administrators. So let's start with our first do, um, events are your friend. So what we're gonna format this a little bit is instead of always diving straight into all the code and everything, I'm gonna go through some use cases here to so, so you can kind of understand like when you would even use some of these uh, techniques. So first use case, we had a, a, a customer that um, uh, they basically you know, uh, wanted to have their marketing team uh, understand customer behavior. The reason for this on the site uh, is because with internal apps, you usually can, like Sales Cloud and Service Cloud, you can, um, you know, once you get them uh, installed and set up and everything else, then you have to sort of train your customers and your internal people uh, to use them. When a B2B commerce uh, app, it's a little different. They're all external. Uh, you could try to train them, but the truth is, since it is external, um, you're gonna have to sort of rely on like figuring out what is it they're doing and are they using the app in the way it was intended. So like with this particular customer of ours, we decided that using analytics was the best way to do that. Uh, so John's gonna go into some more detail about putting analytics into your pages and then sort of keeping track of all the user um, uh, behavior, right, on the, the page and the user journey. Yeah, just so you know, all of the use cases we're talking about are actual use cases we ran into in real client uh, production instances that we handled using code that I've scrubbed, but that is based on actual code that we ran. So in principle, the code that you're seeing here should work with the additions that are obvious from the comments. So our first lesson here is do stuff using events. Now, um, if you are, again, a Visual Force developer, or if you're like a Java developer, which some Apex developers um, have been, because it's pretty much like a variation on Java, you're probably not gonna be thinking in terms of async. But not only is JavaScript running async technically, but Cloud Craze, uh, the B2B commerce front-end framework, is designed to work in an asynchronous way. The framework is already event-driven. The way that all the different parts of a page load, the way that they talk to each other is through events. And this is because, partly because B2B commerce is actually pretty heavyweight on the server side, so in order to improve page performance, most of what actually matters loads client side. And this has been increasingly true as the Cloud Craze versions um, get more and more advanced. There used to be more server side visual force stuff. They now have more and more stuff coming in through JavaScript remoting. So you have to start thinking in those terms. Second thing to note is that because this is JavaScript, and again, this is not gonna be true for a visual force, or this is actually not even gonna be as much of a problem for a Lightning developer, because Lightning has better like component protections and security and stuff. But in straight up JavaScript, that there is one DOM. Everything can touch everything else. The actual B2B front end framework is very structured. It's, there's not a lot of spaghetti there. Of course, as you work with it more and more, there'll be some. But you have to avoid accidentally putting spaghetti in just because it kind of works right now. And a good way to do that is to really be um, rigorous about communicating among different components using events and, and listen to events that uh, Cloud Craze actually sends you automatically. In fact, the front end framework, this is from the, the, the core front end framework code, um, out of the box, for free, you get an event that indicates this view is now refreshed, meaning that it's already rendered. So if you ever wanna do anything that depends on a chunk of the page actually already being there, being available on the DOM, not waiting for any more Ajax and stuff, you'll get one of these events, you see it in red, see, um, this is the code that actually triggers it. It triggers the view colon whatever the view name is, and that's gonna be something like product detail view, view product list view, product search view, header view, all of those things, colon refresh. So you need to, this will trigger it, and you need to listen to that um, like this. The Cloud Craze uh, front end framework, again, has basically it's a wrapper on backbone um, events, pub and sub, so you basically just say CCRZ pub sub on, the name of the view, in this case it's the product detail view. Um, the 
PubSub trigger is going to send the actual concrete view instance, and that's gonna be passed in here, I just named it product detail view in the callback. So if you want to modify the view in any way, in this case what we're doing is, um, in the case of Google Analytics, we're actually taking a bunch of data from this particular product detail view, um, structuring it in a way that's useful for the uh, e-commerce funnel in Google Analytics, and sending it off to Google Analytics as soon as the product detail view renders. So in other words, we have to only do that when the page actually shows because we actually wanna get analytics on not what theoretically we're showing based on the SKU in the URL or something like that, but what the user actually sees. So we're doing that by subscribing to the event. But you can do this for any modifications, and I'll show you some more modifications of the concrete view instance that gets passed in one of these pub subs in a minute. Another thing you can do, again, using the out of the box front end framework, is you can trigger your own events. So CCRZ pub sub trigger is available. CCRZ is this big global object that anything can access, so this is basically like a static utility method here. Um, in this case, what we're doing is, once an order is actually successfully placed, and for this client, we had a very customized order process and involved a lot of external callouts, it was not gonna fit into the normal uh, cloud craze uh, 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 flow. Once the order was actually placed, we got a bunch of data back from the external system that indicated a bunch of stuff about like when it was gonna be fulfilled and blah, 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 stuff that we didn't know inside Salesforce but we wanted to send this data on so that we can, to the analytics system, so that the analytics e-commerce uh, funnel could know what was actually happening, what the users were actually getting. So here, we're listening to the actual call um, that gets the, this is the places the order that does all that external callouts and stuff, and if we get a successful response, then we trigger our custom event and we send the data we got back from the external system to this listener. We're triggering this and then we already have an event listener set up that goes ahead and formats all the e-commerce data and sends it to Google Analytics. So you can listen to events, including the out-of-the-box events, and you can also trigger your own events. Very convenient, and it's uh, the best way to go in our experience. So here's what we actually did. Uh, again, same idea, the name of our event is the one we just showed you, and this is, coincidentally, I just named it the same thing to make it easier to read, but obviously it can be anything you want. And this is where we format all this data that gets fired off into the Google Analytics e-commerce funnel so that the marketing people can see nice little graphs of what everyone's actually doing on their site. Um, the corresponding don't is that you really don't know when stuff is gonna exist on the page. This is universally true, of course, for any kind of um, JavaScript. Async means who knows when it's gonna come back, that's by design, right? The UI framework in general work this way often, but JavaScript does especially because of the unreliability of the web. Um, you also don't really know physically, or you don't have much control, I should say, over physically when JavaScript is going to appear on the page. So you might think like, well, I'll do a little hack and like, because my code is gonna come in farther down on the page, it's going to be able to affect something that appears farther up. But um, you don't really have control over that because uh, there are only a few points at which we'll, you're actually allowed to inject your own JavaScript. This is injected using an Apex include. And those few points mean that um, you may not really be able to put the JavaScript where you would if you were really designing the page yourself. And that in inability to control at a very granular level where your code physically appears on the page is gonna come up again in, in one of our other don'ts. This diagram you can see here is, is from the documentation that will show you these are the different points at which you can inject code. So the points are not much under control and um, you shouldn't rely on them because of uh, general JavaScript shining issues. All right, so that's the don't number one. Uh, next, um, extend, don't replace. All right, well so far this seems a lot different. I mean, in, in normally in Salesforce, when I've developed stuff in the past, there's a lot of Apex, there's like Visual Force. There's, so far everything I've seen is like JavaScript. It's a very JavaScript heavy, isn't it? It's just JavaScript related to web application with right. authentication from communities, yeah. Right, so going on to the next use case, uh, we had a customer you know, that um, needed to segment their uh, user, user experience a bit. Um, great thing about BB Commerce, you can give customers different uh, products that they see, different prices on those products, um, even different themes that they uh, see with configuration. But what, what in this one scenario, we had a customer that wanted uh, to have that kind of like a standard uh, customers and VIP customers and have a completely different experience uh, when they're on the site. And actually part of the experience was like um, just having like annual points that they'd have and they could sort of use them to make some of their purchases. Um, when you're gonna change the experience in the front end, there's a bit of work to that. So it's not as easy as maybe you might think it would be. Yeah, and I'm gonna skip over the, um, what is recommended as the first level of UI customization because this is mostly a JavaScript talk. But I'll mention later on, there are a bunch of things you can do declaratively to just change whether you have a two column or three column layout, just make certain widgets appear or not. Those are things admins can do in the special CC admin, the Cloud Craze admin, very customized screen. I'm gonna assume that you maybe have tried that, although we'll get back to that later. At this point, we know that you need to actually change some code because you can't point and click customize. 
And a recommendation here is that you might be tempted, if you're like a JavaScript developer, to just build it yourself. And it's like, oh, you know, e-commerce is not that hard. I kind of have intuitions about this, mostly from B to C, probably. Um, the lesson that we learned uh, occasionally painfully over time on these projects is that your intuitions about B to B are probably gonna get you about 80% of the way. You'll probably be able to fairly straightforwardly build uh, a front end for B to B 80%, but there's a lot of little things, especially when you get to the cart and checkout page, that you probably didn't think of. Just, just to be honest, unless you have a lot of experience writing your own B2B front ends. Um, so, and you will also find that your intuitions, even if you, again, think that you can isolate them, probably your B2C intuitions are gonna come creeping in a little bit. And in a sense, that's good, because this is also gonna happen with the users. B2B buyers have certain expectations, but once they see a site that looks Amazon-like, they're gonna start thinking about that. But you can try to account for that and uh, see the best, not as effectively as Salesforce already has or CloudCrace already has. So don't trust your intuitions there. There is, of course, judgment involved about whether you need to reinvent wheels. I'm not gonna say you should never reinvent wheels. Sometimes you do need to do that. In this case, because of the complexity of the problem domain and because of how effectively it's handled in a pretty structured way, we recommend not doing that. So that means instead, basically copy pasting an existing template, one of these uh, view templates, and then modifying it in the page that you inject. So I'll give you a little bit of an example of how you might do this. Um, so this is a header. Um, what, are, what we're doing here is we're going to create a new template. This is going to be a handlebars template. And if you haven't used handlebars before, there's actually a talk right after ours, which is basically a straight up introduction to handlebars with Salesforce B2B Commerce. It's just a simple JavaScript templating uh, library. What we're doing here is we really just need to add one extra little element to the menu. And it's gonna be an element that is not actually available in the standard CC menu object, so it's not gonna be configurable, because it has to go to completely custom uh, functionality. So what we're doing is we really are adding only one line item, only one, um, you know, in this case it's gonna be an ordered list because <coughs> we're using Bootstrap. Um, all we're doing is we're adding this little thing in green, right, go to reports, and um, that is the definition of the template. And then to wire that up, there's this special little bottleneck uh, object, CCRZ UI properties, and a cloud craze view when it renders looks inside CCRZ UI properties dot whatever the name of the view is, and then it decides what is the ID of the template it actually is going to use, and it's gonna be our ID. So it's gonna use our ID instead of the out of the box template. Um, just so you know, this desktop thing, that's sort of legacy in the past uh, B2B commerce or cloud craze, did use different, used modernizer to check your form factors and actually switch templates depending on uh, your view your uh, uh, form factor. Now it uses modern bootstrap and so everything is actually responsive. The desktop templates don't actually disappear, so just always use the desktop template, really. So we created the customization with paste, which I'm not gonna show you because that's really boring, and then we wired it up using UI properties over here. Very simple extension. Now we can do anything we want with it. What we also wanna do, though, in addition to actually changing the template by adding a little bit, is we want to change the functionality. So we're going to use one of those pub subs again in this case, um, the header view has refreshed, and we're gonna modify the um, view instance. We're not gonna be changing the template. The template's already available. We've already wired that up. But here we're taking the event on the header view. We're adding another event, which is a listener, a, cl a click listener, to this go to reports class. And when you do that, what, what, in the, you de define the actual function that gets called. And this is backbone stuff. Backbone is just gonna pass the event automatically with it on this events attribute to whatever the function is, or the method is that you're calling. And all we're doing is we're going to this particular um, URL over here. Um, final thing to note here when using Backbone, this will, none of this will actually work until you delegate events. So you've changed the object, but the listeners don't get attached until you actually do this. So now this is, we're all clean, we have our header view, and we've added some stuff to the header view, and it's gonna do whatever we want. Um, the thing not to do, I already mentioned this a little bit, is that um, don't try to reinvent the B2B commerce wheel. You probably are gonna have intuitions that are not quite right, again, just to be realistic. You also might think, and I did this more, this is still a valuable thing to do, that you can look at the code and figure out the logic from the code. And the code is usually pretty clean, and, but it's not well commented. All the server-side code is in a managed package, so you won't be able to see that. And the logic, again, is split between server and client. So even if you think you can fully understand kind of what's going on in the client by reading the code, you may not know the motivations because you can't see the code on the server side. So that's our recommendation there. Um, item number three, lesson design with the out-of-the-box SPAV in mind. So um, this has actually happened to us a lot of times. Uh, when we work with our customers and sometimes other partners, you'll have the instance where maybe your marketing team um, has a design ready that they want to use for the site. Maybe it's uh, another partner and they have a UX firm and whatever else. Um, one of the things about people, uh, UX designers, 
you know, they really want rich, beautiful experiences. You know, they put a lot of uh, work into it. Um, a lot of times they don't necessarily have experience in B2B commerce in general, and they especially probably don't have any experience in just the Salesforce B2B commerce. There's certain aspects they need to be aware of uh, when you're designing uh, the site. So our recommendation, and, and listen to this one, <laughs> is to have them and you be involved early on. Um, because what will happen is they'll make these decisions on how you, uh, the user journey is, maybe certain elements of the screen, and those things can really like bloat the amount of hours you're going to be spending sort of redoing everything in the front end. And, um, if you can work with them and say, hey, you know, these, I'm probably doing a little bit into your slides, but if you can just work with them and kind of make sure that some of the changes are going to be, um, work well with the platform, that's the best thing to do. But anyway, John will go into more details about that. Yeah, and, and this is actually more of an issue as um, modern front-end development from a design point of view gets more object-oriented, more actually uh, rigorous and, and um, more like programming. So this is not, what I'm, we're saying here is not designers don't know what they're doing, where developers and we can't do what designers can do, but the issue we often run into is that some of these modern development technologies and some of the assumptions that are made by an external design firm where they create like a fully functional mockup may be true if they actually control the whole web application, because they're thinking of it as a web application, but may not be true or may take a lot of effort later on to untangle if we're dealing specifically with B2B commerce. This is especially true um, because of the different specific places your code actually gets injected. You can't fully control that. There's only a few spots where your code can actually be placed inside one of these pages. Um, some of the more modern, like higher level CSS kind of stuff, like SAS, produces some really long selectors in CSS that are very, very specific. And if the page structure is not fully controlled, which it isn't in the case of B2B commerce, those selectors may be wrong, you may have to mess with them, and SAS generated selectors are not fun to mess with, in my estimation, as a person who's not super comfortable with SAS. The assumptions the designers are often making will be often reasonable, but just won't apply to B2B commerce. So here's a couple of examples. Um, here's an example of like a really long selector. This is again an actual selector from, uh, that was generated by SAS in a, in a project. Small little adjustment, but um, the container structure is assumed, and actually the container structure, it turns out, had to be broken up. There were other places where different parts of the DOM needed to be, uh, uh, actually were in, uh, introduced by the way that the Cloud Crave front-end framework is structured. So we ended up having to mess with this, and it took a while after the fact to work with the designer to be like, oh, right, the page structure is not going to be what I hope it's going to be. Um, that's one kind of a problem, is overly structured CSS that you run into if you don't talk to the designer up front. Another problem you run into, and again, this is, uh, this is reasonable on the part of front-end uh, framework people. Modern JavaScript-heavy front people, so not CSS, JavaScript-heavy front-end people, may be more accustomed to a more sophisticated, more modular, more opinionated um, framework, like React or like Angular, and they may not quite realize, for, for example, how, um, uh, how little, in one sense, Backbone can do, and so they might give up on it. So they might give you something like this. Um, well, we're going to just do a mock-up, pretty much, and so let's directly manipulate the, the state of the DOM. Let's write some what seems to me like sad spaghetti code, um, when they should be doing something like this, but they can't because they don't actually know the business use case. They're just, and they probably aren't, again, backbone developers because not too many people are these days. So sad code versus happy code. Uh, John, why, why is that sad? Why is that sad? Well, but it's very sad for me because if I ever have to modify it, I'm like, oh, what is going on here? I have to conclude from the visual state of things, what elements are visible or not, what the actual state of the page is. And again, that's okay for a designer. Um, and, but what you really want is this is really indicating that we, a claim exists. Let's say this is gonna be like a case management kind of a thing that was the use case here. Instead of saying like, well, the delete claim button is hidden, which means the claim doesn't exist, and the submit does exist, or does not exist, sorry, because it doesn't, uh, the claim doesn't exist, you should say, here's we're going to set a state, the claim exists, but the claim does not exist. And the rest of your code after that will figure out um, what to display and what not to display. But um, the front-end designer people are not necessarily, unless you bring them in up front, going to be thinking in these terms. They'll be thinking in terms of the visuals. So um, don't build on top of that. Bring them in early. Um, this is just the further complications of that, so we'll actually skip through. Fourth lesson here is componentize. It's fairly obvious, but let's talk about some examples. All right, just real quick, in this use case, our customer basically, you know, they, uh, in, uh, in uh, B2B commerce, you know, there's uh, a lot of things are out of the box. Uh, I'm just gonna pick on this particular use case, which is the tabs. You go to product, you see different tabs, like specifications, uh, you know, uh, and then um, out of that, uh, you might want to go above and beyond. So in this particular scenario, um, the customer basically wanted to have um, 
for different products, you know, different uh, details that are internal on each of those tabs. So you drill down the tab, and the tab have even more information. And then the thing that we're trying to get to here is that um, these components um, are very complex that we're going to be customizing in like the tabs for this particular customer. And having the ability to have this feature kind of uh, tap on off on different products um, can be a little bit difficult as a B2B commerce uh, framework. And this is, of course, a general lesson. In general, you don't want to repeat yourself unnecessarily. But there's a couple of things that make that a little more complex for, um, for the CCRZ framework. One is that all the out-of-the-box templates, the ones I'm telling you to extend rather than completely replace, if you actually look at them, they have an awful lot of if statements in there. And those if statements are looking at configurations. So if this configuration is set, show this. If this configuration is set, show that. That's okay, although it, you know, nobody likes a lot of if statements, but it can be okay out of the box, but if you're going to start building additional complexity into those templates, you're gonna have nested if statements, you're gonna create these horrible pyramids and you're going to hate yourself and future developers are gonna hate you. You never wanna do that. Um, the other thing is that, uh, again, backbone with handlebars is not as abstract. Components are not as modular or object-like as in a more modern JavaScript framework like React or Angular, so there's already gonna be a little bit of tendency to have more procedural ways of thinking about your templates. So our suggestion to avoid that is um, there's a, a neat feature that handlebars has, which is partials. These are basically ways to embed templates inside templates. Um, that's that little thing in blue with the um, little carrot over here, the greater than sign. All that's happening here is, again, this is an example of our template. We're using a registrar partial method on the handlebars framework to say, anytime you have this little carrot with common stuff, then render it into this template, my common template over here. And what actually gets, what happens here is um, you can, after the reference to the name of the partial, you can put a space and then any data you wanna pass in relative to where you are in the template, but by default, whatever this is, is passed in. So what you often end up doing is, you're saying like, this is really just an extension of this template um, I'm going to give, do, get, have available in my little sub-template everything that's available over here. So this is automatically going in there. That's to avoid stuff like this, obviously, right? Repetition, um, why would you have these uh, helpers in two different places? If you're following the existing structure with a lot of these ifs, so this if display, again, is check, this is checking a setting, an admin setting, whatever the declarative things. If you're just following that logic, you might just paste in your customizations. But what you really wanna do is keep it as componentized as possible using partial. and. Um, We'll get back to that uh, heavy declarative customization, uh, positive and negatives in a minute. All right, lesson number five, use the actual CCRZ backbone framework. All right, so um, in BDB Commerce, you're gonna hear a lot of acronyms like PDP, PLP, for example, you know, product list page, product detail page, checkout pages. A lot of these things come with the product, and you can kind of override the templates and look at them. But what happens if you get to a scenario where you have a completely different page? You know, how do you get that uh, page or even group of pages to be in the product? Uh, is it just as easy as creating a visual force page and putting it out there? Mm, not so simple. Um, so um, in, our, in this scenario, with a customer, they want a whole like FAQ sort of modular uh, modules to the site. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is basically kind of how to do that in such a way that you can kind of bring in kind of the the theme of the BDB Commerce site and, and, and um, have like the header and the footer be the same, for example, and um, so John will go into more detail about that. Yeah, and the way you do that normally with uh, BDB Commerce is using these things called CC subscriber pages. So if you wanna keep the theme, you wanna keep the header and footer, you basically create a record that says, when I look at this URL with a certain page key, then inject this Visual Force page via an Apex include. All right, so you have to create a Visual Force page when you do this, you can do it in one of two ways. You can do it where you're, you pretty much have a completely blank page and you can do anything you want. Or you can do it where you have um, the, the header and the footer and the rest of the framework available to you. Our recommendation again is, you probably do want to take advantage of the existing CCRZ framework. And again, if you're an Apex programmer, this may not be super intuitive. Remember though, that most of the CCRZ content, again, increasingly over time, is not rendered on the server. Um, and that means that um, you probably are gonna have to do things on your custom pages. There's a good chance that really rely on the asynchronous events that the framework is doing. A, a common one is when the cart changes. If something gets added to the cart, you might want your little widget to update visibly, right? You might also want different things to display depending on whether the cart has a certain state. And whether the cart has a state or not is, is communicated using an event. The, the event is called cart change. That'll all be available to you for free. You can listen to it happily. You can talk to the cart using these events if you do use the CCRZ backbone framework instead of just building a straight up Visual Force page and just sticking it in between the header and footer. Um, also remember um, that, uh, well, remember that uh, the way that BB Commerce works, this is a fact of the business, this is not just because of the specific framework, is 
because there's a lot of complex stuff going on on the server side, a lot of complex entitlement, pricing, and all of this, a full-fledged page load, which has to, because it's reloading the whole application, run through all of that logic over again, is gonna be extra slow. So as much as possible, you want to avoid full page loads, even more than in normal modern JavaScript, because of the complexity that's going on in the back end for B2B purposes. Um, so what you want to do is you want to use um, asynchronous work and you want to use asynchronous work, do asynchronous work using the CCRZ framework because that framework already handles a lot of uh, client and server state syncing, which is going to be one of your problems. Um, if we have time, I can go into that in a little more detail. I don't think we'll have time, but there's a special object available on the page that's designed to be pretty much isomorphic with an object on the server. That's a global object that is available to all your server side logic. You want to make sure you're using that. Well, the server's going to be doing a lot of stuff that you're not accustomed to. All right, final note, final lesson here is uh, this is more Salesforce specific, not even B2B specific, but support declarative customization. And I'll give you an example of how to do that. All right, so so far a lot of things you've seen, are, you know, are, it's a lot, it's code heavy, um, and we haven't talked a lot about the, you know, the configuration aspect, but there's a good, good news is uh, B2B Commerce has a, a, a thing called CC Admin, which is, uh, CC stands for you know, Cloud Craze, or you could think of it as Commerce Cloud. Um, but it has a, a list of all these switches you can turn uh, page elements on and off and other features as well that come with the product. But the awesome thing is you can actually put in your own customizations into that. So in this scenario, we had a customer that, um, you know, most of the times these e-commerce projects are very complex and, you know, there's integrations to ERPs and outside systems and everything else. And sometimes those systems are not ready for the, the commerce site that we're, we're creating. So be able to push these things out to production but then not have them enabled yet and then um, maybe go into CC admin and then turn those switches on at a later date would be a really awesome thing, and that's actually something you can do. Yeah, and again, um, this is uh, trying to extend the, the idea that Salesforce always expects, which is that you need to be able to let users do a lot of things without changing code. So feature flags are one of these examples. Um, a, a very other simple examples that are actually already supported out of the box are, do I want to show this widget or not? There's a lot of that level of customization you can do in CC admin at the level of each individual storefront just by pointing and clicking, and uh, the assumption here is that uh, the client or the user is going to expect to be able to do this for a lot of different things. Um, there are some things you should do at a per storefront level and some things you shouldn't do at a per storefront level. There are also um, specific reasons that we'll get into about uh, what, what things probably should not be stored in CC Admin, but on the whole, the reason you should use CC Admin is because in your handlebars templates, in your JavaScript, all the settings that are specific to this page, that are specific to this storefront, will be available for you automatically to do any work on. So you create one of these custom customizations, custom configurations, and you give it a little like string, a very short string um, with, with a value, and that'll already be available in the, the CCRZ page bars object actually on the page. And it'll be available inside your handlebars templates with that little if display helper we saw a second ago. So you can build your logic out in the templates and make it accessible declaratively to um, admins using this, uh, if you're using the Cloud Craze framework and if you're using CC admin for settings. Now, it is not, of course, um, always the case that you should not store variables in code. It, usually, you probably shouldn't store configurable variables in code, but uh, you know, to say that you should never do that is sort of like a project manager perspective, a little bit more than a developer perspective. It's a good idea in general, but sometimes you do want to store it in the code. But, and sometimes you don't want to store it in one place, sometimes you want to store it in another. As a Salesforce developer, um, you've probably already run into this. Um, some examples of things that are good things to store in CC Admin that'll be available with these switches in your um, templates are, should this particular button be visible on this storefront um, and not in this other storefront? Um, one example is in one storefront, the same customer said, you can request um, a, a quote on this storefront and you can't on this other storefront, but we wanted to use the same template, so we created a custom setting for this and that was already available in our templates. Another one was, um, what is the, some sort of threshold logic? So what is the cart subtotal below which shipping is not charged? If you put that setting in CC Admin, it can be accessible both to the web, to the front end, and also to the back end logic. If your cart logic pricing or validation logic needs to look at this number, you want it to be available at a first or front level. There are some things, of course, you should not include in CC Admin. Um, these are things like, um, for example, uh, what stage is this org in in our release process? That isn't specific to a storefront, that's just specific to your org. Wouldn't put that in CC Admin, probably want to build a little bit of additional work around that if you need to change your front end, depending on whether we're in UAT, let's say maybe you want to show debug messages, or if you're in prod where you don't want to show debug messages. Uh, we do not have time for this, so I'm gonna skip past this, but that's that isomorphic object that I mentioned. And, and finally, let's just go over a little bit of how this all translates to the process. Let's put this together, and we'll give you a suggested 
order of operations for going about uh, a, a cloud crazed uh, front end customization project that involves messing with code. Uh, the first thing, again, right at the beginning, is walk the designer through cloud crazed DOM structure on whatever pages they're actually going to be messing with. So show them what all the containers are, show them how the CSS is working out of the box, make sure that they know this, because if you show this to them up front, then all that horrible fiddling later will be unnecessary. It's usually pretty easy to get to actually factor in if you know what it's going to be. Second thing to do is make sure you've reviewed with the PM and with the designer the levels of customization that are available. So that is, again, there's a bunch of declarative th stuff you can already do out of the box to show or hide certain widgets and certain layouts. Do that first before you start messing with code or even start designing the code you're gonna mess with. Um, because if you don't, then a lot of those declarative things produce whole new containers that, again, are gonna mess up your design or mess up your code if you haven't decided at the config level what you're gonna be working with. Next, wanna make sure work with the architect and with other developers that your logic is located in the right place. So for example, if you need to um, always say, like, have, uh, have some logic that says, um, this user is of a certain type, you probably want to inject that at a certain level. You might want to even put it in a theme file, let's say, so it's available to all pages, rather than just at the specific page that you happen to be working on. And also, it's a little bit annoying to sync theme files using version control, so getting that right up front is a, is a good idea. Then you do that non-code customization, the declarative stuff, and then finally do the actual code customization. And the goal here is that by the time you get to the iterate stage, you're mostly doing it between steps five and six, between the code and um, the iterations. Because in theory, you know, the code is a lot more variable space here. Um, you, don't, you shouldn't really need all that much iteration on the configuration side. It's pretty easy to, to visualize and to immediately see what the declarative front end customizations can do. All right, and if any of this is, and some of people have left, and I wonder if this is why, um, if any of this is making you think, what are we even talking about? What are those templates? What is handlebars and all that? There actually is another session coming up very shortly in which they'll introduce, um, which I don't actually know these people, but it looked like a perfect session, how to actually just use handlebars in general with the front end framework. So how to use code to customize the front end, not with these lessons, but at all with more walkthroughs. And that is our presentation, and we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, and in, you know, connectivity problems are always gonna be an issue, that's always gonna be a problem, but um, I agree that trying to put as much stuff on the server side makes more sense. Um, uh, it is the case also that as the versions of Cloud Craze have gotten later and later, they have moved more stuff to the more logical place for it to go. Um, right now, Cart and Checkout do have a lot more logic in the page than you would think, but there are REST APIs that are available if you wanna do a completely new front end, and the REST APIs have become more, custom, more uh, capable over time. So if your checkout process is different, and it sounds like it's not that different, it's just a connectivity issue you're trying to handle, then you might even think about just using the REST APIs instead of the front end at all. But if it's pretty similar to the out of the box, then yes, I would just move the custom logic as much as I can. And uh, you know, you can also, uh, on mobile, a lot of the stuff that would be more expected to be normally available on a, um, a desktop browser, like uh, which is available, but which is less easy to, to work with, like local storage and things like that. Those are things that modern JavaScript developers are more likely to want to use that are, I think, not super optimal for this particular use case. Yeah. Anything else in five seconds? <laughs> Three. So I wonder, uh, how do you see the future of, of the framework? I mean, is this something historical that has come with CloudCrate, or is this a really something that's worth learning even for the next five years? Uh, do you want to talk about that, because you have more of the history here? Um, I can give my opinion, but. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, so I guess, um, I don't, I mean, uh, we've been to other sessions and talked to folks about uh, this, the experience and the handlebars and, uh, and backbone, it's going to be around for, for quite a long time. That, that we knew, do know because the product is very mature. And we do know it came from like cloud craze and everything else. Um, there was a lot of time and effort put into it. I, I would see it to be a really difficult thing to like kind of uh, redo, but I do know that there's been some lightning components that have come out recently that they're trying to um, help with the ease, but most of those components are from the perspective of you're having customers that are like maybe a self-service community, for example, um, and then they're, you know, they're in there and they want to somehow transition to this B2B commerce storefront, which is actually a visual force community and a completely different experience, and trying to marry the two is a little bit of a it's kind of disjointed, so they're trying to help with that by actually making some more components over here, but they're still n like nowhere, my own opinion, nowhere near the features that like, you did in, in this um, 
uh, more of a, I'll call it like a legacy product, whatever. So as far as I know, I mean, I think it would be a good thing to sort of learn because I don't think it's gonna be going away for, if I had my crystal ball, like five years or whatever, I think it's gonna be around for a while just because it'd be a really difficult undertaking, so. And I think especially if you're likely to be working on more complex projects, this as a straight up visual force web application is very, very powerful and customizable in a way that lightning components, um, not right out of the box at least are. So if it's not gonna fit in that lightning box, this is what you're gonna be working with. Yep. All right, anything else? Nope, no more time. All right, thank you very much. We can also take questions outside, yeah, outside. Uh, as well. Yeah. So.